Okay, you guys can see me? Can you guys see me? Okay, knowledge, the internet will be strong. Internet connectivity will be blessed in Jesus' name, right? Otherwise, we are in trouble. Let me see if I can go down. Well, I can't kill it. You got to pray, guys. I'm at a college and there's a lot of activities going on and people using the internet so i don't know pray it won't buffer by the grace and mercy of the lord jesus christ pray the internet connectivity will stay strong so i can get a session in right thank you brother al evans keep praying in jesus name i get healthier lose more weight look better feel better but more importantly i'll pray by the power of the lord jesus christ i be holier more in love with Jesus, more discipline, self-control, self-discipline. To pray more intensely, fast, study the scriptures, meditate upon the scriptures, live them out by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Jesus Christ, right? And to then serve others by my deeds, not just lip service, right? Because we want to be doers of the word, not because our works save us, but our works are the result of being saved by the Holy Spirit and demonstrate that we truly love Jesus Christ. Amen? And pray for the internet connectivity and god guys pray in jesus name i've gotten permission see i told you let me see maybe i can put down the resolution sorry about that okay. sorry about that like i said i'm at a bible college and internet connection may not be that strong I'll try to put down the resolution. Let's see, down to 360. That's probably that will help in Jesus' name, right? Anyway, guys, pray for me. I got favor on this side. My state, I can relocate. They've submitted the necessary paperwork for me so I can get permission from the other state to move. Please pray the door will open in Jesus' name and no door, door will shut. I am trusting in Jesus. His will is perfect. His will shall be done in my life. And it'll give me the wisdom to understand why things happen the way they do for his glory, right? But I am trusting that the Lord Jesus has got me to this point because he is opening that door for me to relocate. And then I'm trusting that eventually my daughters and I will be together and I can raise them in the love of Jesus, right? And ask the Lord Jesus to grant me the gift of contentment. If he's not, if it's not as well for me to find a godly spouse, a godly woman who loves Jesus, who will work with me to glorify Christ and spread the kingdom, then ask him to give me the grace to be content. Crucify my, my flesh for his glory, right? No, Michelle, that's not going to happen. Ironically, Michelle Dangler, my ex-wife's name is Michelle. You have the same name she does. So now, now that you know what I keep praying. All right. Should we begin in prayer? Uh, our friend Protestant believers here waiting for a few more faces. Like I said, I'm working to get it to 200 and eventually to get it a thousand because it's not about numbers, but I want more people to benefit, more people to listen, more people to subscribe. So that if God is pleased to give me wisdom and knowledge from the spirit to teach, then I can disseminate this knowledge for the glory of Jesus. Because remember what first Corinthians 12, if you start reading even from verse one, and read all the way to 31, actually. Read the entire chapter. But specifically, verses 4 to 11, we are told that the Holy Spirit gives every member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ specific gifts to cultivate, perfect, and he empowers every member of the body of Christ to use those gifts to build others in the body of Christ. This is why in God's wisdom, no one individual... And I need you guys just to focus so you can learn the scriptures and live them out for the glory of Christ. This is why no one individual has been given all the gifts of the Spirit. You guys know why? Yeah, you guys can hear the background, right? I know. What can I do? This is a public place. It's a college. 
Now, Andrew Martin, you want me to go lay hands on them? Yeah. I can tell them, but they're, they're going to think that I'm being rude, right? Anyway, do you know why no one human individual has been given all the gifts of the Holy Spirit? No one individual? Yep, amen. Alan Rule, God bless you as a brother in Christ. Does anyone have an idea why? So that no one individual becomes a center of attention and that the members of the body of Christ do not look to, <laughs> cling to, depend on any imperfect, finite human creature, that we depend on the perfect, glorious, triune God who supplies our needs and also to teach us that we cannot function independently from the body of Jesus Christ because we are members of the body, we are inseparable, interdependent, and I need you just as much as you need me. That's the wisdom of God. So you may need my gift to teach you, but I may need your gift to pray for me. I may need your gift to counsel me, and I may need your finance. That's a gift. Right? Even giving financially, sacrificially, that's a work of grace. Some people really have to discipline themselves. And really force themselves to give because they're afraid that they won't make it. Others just give like it's going out of style with open hands and no fear and no regret. That's a gift. Yep, exactly, Andrew Martin. So is that clear? That's clear, right? Just wanted to say, understand the wisdom of God and not giving any one human creature all the gifts. So that the triune God will be our focus, our life, our love, our devotion. Okay, now, still waiting for a few more faces to show up. I'm going to deal with 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 15 and 16, which is another passage that's misquoted, right? To show that God the Father can never be seen. Alrighty. Keep praying for the internet connectivity, guys. If it gets bad, I'm going to just have to cancel this. But let's see. Let's see what happens. All right. Let me know. Is it good now? Okay. Yep, it happens. It's going to be like that. What can I do? Yep, like I said, this is a college. They're using the internet. So I can't, you know, you can't stop people. And pray for me, right? Anyway, hopefully, hopefully we'll get through the session. With no problems by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Hopefully. And, um, well, if I don't use wireless, then I don't have internet. So, lovely. Let me just turn off the wireless, and then we don't have internet, and I can talk to myself in the computer screen. Yeah. I don't want to be nice about it, JoJo Mon Monster. I really... My flesh, right? May the Lord crucify my flesh. Anyway, I'm going to deal with 1 Timothy 6, 15 to 16, God willing. That's another passage that's misapplied, misquoted to prove that God the Father can never be seen in any sense, right? In Jesus' name, Alan Rahul, Ruhul, the Holy Spirit will fill you with wisdom and knowledge to know what to say and how to share it to this Muslim, to reveal to that Muslim the true God revealed in Jesus Christ so that Muslim will fall in love with Jesus. Yes, hold on. Lovely, one second. You know, I love you. You're all together lovely. I'm going to tell the college here, hey, guys, uh, I'm in the midst of a live stream. I don't want to use wireless. Can I use your cable so that I can disrupt the live stream so I can change from wireless to cable? <laughs> oh, man. All right. We love you, Father. Lord Jesus, Son of the Most High, the Father's heart, his beloved, we love you. We love you, Holy Spirit. Father, again, you don't need any of us. We need you. And it's by your grace and love and mercy that you set us apart to use us to glorify your name, to magnify Jesus and the power of your Holy Spirit, to spread and advance the kingdom of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. So, Father, I ask right now for a powerful anointing on me for the sake of your servants to glorify Jesus Christ. Fill us with the Spirit. Anoint us with wisdom and knowledge by your Holy Spirit. Enable me to speak clearly without error for the glory of Jesus, not for the praise of men. And crucify my flesh. Constrain me from being unnecessarily offensive, Father. 
bless everyone here with wisdom and knowledge from the Holy Spirit to understand the depth of Scripture and give us the power of your Spirit to live the Scriptures, to obey you, to love you, to worship you, to just magnify you by our deeds, not just our, our lips, Father. Cover us with the blood of Jesus. Cover our loved ones with the blood of Jesus. Cover my daughters with the blood of Jesus and save us and protect us, Father, for the sake of your Son, the Lord Jesus. And Father, grant me favor. Open these doors of blessing that no man can shut and transform, become more like Jesus, to be used mightily to glorify Christ until I die or until the Lord returns. And bless the people here, Father. They love me for the sake of Jesus. And enable me to love them in return by using the gifts you've given me to serve them, to build them up by the power of your Holy Spirit. Fill my lungs and my throat and chest with the health I need to glorify Christ. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to their ears and save us from distractions. Because we want to do this for your glory and bless the internet connectivity, Father, please. Thank you. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' almighty name. Amen. Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit. Welcome, Zena. Hope I can see your brother. Choose Jesus. How's he doing? I missed the guy. Is he upset at me? I wouldn't be shocked. Who, whom have I not upset and offended? Okay. So pray, guys. Within two to three weeks, I can make the move. Please pray for favor. Ah, oh, sovereign Lord. Yahovah, Father, Holy Spirit. Okay. All right. Are we ready? We're 66. Come on now. I want to see it to go over 100 because I want more people to learn. This is probably going to be the final session I do because I pretty much made a case. I've demonstrated there is not a single passage in Scripture. I know this is going to shock some and offend some, but scripturally speaking, if we're going to be faithful to Scripture and allow Scripture to interpret Scripture, there isn't a single passage in Scripture that says God the Father cannot be seen in any sense, nor is there a passage in Scripture that says that God the Father has not been seen. We've actually seen the opposite is true, right? Right? We've seen the opposite is true. Where God the Father has appeared visibly in a visible shape in the Old and New Testaments. In fact, remember the words of our Lord Jesus in yesterday's session? Let me just remind you what our Lord says. Let's go to John 5, 37. I'm going to deal with 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. And Lord willing, in the description box, I'm going to put links to my articles where I quote the Jehovah Witnesses admitting that 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16 is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. They even admit that. Thank you, Timothy. We'll pray that I can continue to bless you in the power of the Holy Spirit and love you for the sake of the Lord. And that by the grace of God, you can put up with my imperfections as the Lord sanctifies me from those things. Okay, John 5, 37. Read with me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen a shape. The assumption in our Lord's words, pretty clear. What's the assumption? Just like the Father has a voice that can be heard. Obviously, the way God speaks is unlike his creatures because he doesn't have a physical mouth or, or a tongue or larynx, right, or a throat. But nonetheless, he speaks perfectly and clearly. And so notice what our Lord says. I, guys, I want you guys to pay attention. Just like the Father has a voice that can be heard, he has a shape that can be seen. Now, God by nature is shapeless. We know that. But the one who created all shapes and forms can assume any shape, any form, and multiple shapes and forms at the same time and be bound by none of them, right? But you understand the implication of the words of our Lord Jesus in John 5, 37? Speaking of the Father, not just himself, the Father has a shape just like the Father has a voice. Do you see it? And if you want the details on what this passage doesn't mean, watch last night's session. Let's look at it again. Let's look at it again to see. I need you guys to pay attention because I want you to learn. Okay. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen a shape. Now, he's not saying no one has ever heard the voice of the Father. He's saying you, because of your unbelief, show you've not heard his voice. Now, to prove to you that the Father has a voice and a shape, let me show you where the Father's voice has been heard, proving just like the Father has a voice that can be heard, he has a shape that can be seen. Are you ready for the proof? So we can move on to 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. We'll talk about other issues. Are you ready for the proof? Okay. John 12, verses 28 to 30. I already elaborated on this passage yesterday, but again, I want to remind you, 
that according to our Lord Jesus, the Father has a shape, not a shape that has been his eternally, because God by nature is shapeless, formless, but a shape that he can assume and appear in. And that shape has been seen by Daniel and John, among others. Okay, Daniel and Daniel 7, John in Revelation chapter 4 and 5. Okay, now, John 12, 28 to 30. Watch here. Watch here. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven. Guys, pay attention. A voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So he says to the Father, glorify your name. And the voice of the Father says, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. It sounded like thunder. Others said an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sake. So what more proof do you need that the Father has a voice and also has a shape? Because here they heard the voice of the Father. Now, some couldn't discern it was the Father's voice because they're hearing it for the first time. And others thought it was an angel. But John 5, 37 is quite clear, folks. Just like the Father has a voice, he can assume a shape and has a shape by which individuals can see him is that clear please do smash that like button listen to cabello right. okay i don't want hater wood to get a thousand and i get nothing anyway is that clear now what about first timothy 6 15 and 16 first timothy 6 15 and 16 some people say that my nose is beautiful. I don't know. Kind of looks like I got a boxer's nose, even though I've never boxed. Hey, Kyle Driver, no one cares what you have to say. You're just a rabby dog foaming. We don't care. Go and seek counseling. Go speak to someone who cares. Send him on his merry way. First Timothy 6, 15 and 16. Which in his times shall show. Now pay attention. Who is the blessed only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power and everlasting. Amen. Okay, did you guys catch it here? This is the passage that's used to show that the Father has not been seen and cannot be seen, right? This is another passage that's used. Now, Lord willing, I'm going to put in the description box a little later links to my articles where I quote, Two publications from the Joe's Witnesses where even the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, listen to this. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of the Joe's Witnesses admit that 1 Timothy 6, 15, 16 is not about the Father. So here's a passage, folks, that people quote to show that God the Father has not been seen and can never be seen, right? And unfortunately, there are certain translations in English that insert the word God in verses 15 and 16 even though the Greek does not have the word God. Do you know that in context, Paul is not speaking of God the Father, that in context, the things he just said in verses 15 and 16 are, are about the Lord Jesus Christ? Did you guys know that? The nearest referent antecedent to the pronouns are Jesus Christ, not God the Father. So this passage, ironically, which is misquoted to prove that the Father cannot be seen, is actually referring to about the lord jesus christ you guys know that and i'm going to demonstrate that right now are you ready are you ready well that's the only way you can understand it first last if you're going to be contextual let's read first timothy 6 13 to 16 starting at 13 now i want you guys to be attentive meditate focus as holy spirit grants you illumination pay attention pay attention to the pronouns, okay? Let's do this. First Timothy 6, 13, 16. I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, who gives life to all things. And before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, above reproach, don't fail. Until, now pay attention to the pronouns, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times... He shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, 
who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto and no man hath seen or can see to whom be honor and power everlasting amen pay attention and follow the pronouns follow the pronouns thank you sean sean by the way to answer your question you're gonna have to call me because i don't do text so if you want an answer to the question you asked me you're gonna have to call me but guys pay attention focus did you pay attention to the nearest reference to the of the pronouns the nearest antecedent the last person mentioned isn't the father go back to 14 it's our lord jesus christ so now connect the pronouns to the nearest antecedent until the appearing of our lord jesus christ which in jesus's times jesus shall show jesus is the blessed and only potentate the king of kings the lord of lords jesus only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto whom no man jesus is is one that no man hath seen nor can see to whom be honor and power everlasting amen is that clear did you guys catch it who is paul referring to in the context one means yes two means no who is paul referring to in the context Can someone tell me? Okay. Now I got to explain what it means for Paul to say, no one has seen the Lord Jesus Christ when many have seen him. Now, first, let me further confirm to you that he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6.15 one more time. 1 Timothy 6.15. I'm going to give you further confirmation that Paul is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ by now looking at the language in light of the Bible as a whole. Uh, writer of the clouds. You're going to be the next one. Okay. Now let's read. Jesus Christ is the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let's go to Revelation 17, 14 to see who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 17, 14. Now, mind you, a title of deity, a title describing God can be applied to Christ and to the Father and the Holy Spirit. So just because in one place a title is applied to Jesus doesn't mean it can't be applied to the Father or the Spirit in some other place. But what I'm doing, and I need you to pay attention, I'm showing not only in the context is Jesus the one being referred to as the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, but this is further confirmed that these are titles of Jesus elsewhere. So let me repeat that point one more time. You can have a title of deity, a title telling us something about God, applied to Jesus in one passage, and then applied to the Father in another passage, and or the Holy Spirit in another passage. You with me there? But the reason why I'm going to Revelation 17, 14 is to reinforce the fact that Jesus is called the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, which means that you should have no problem seeing from the context that it's Jesus who's being thus described because he's the one who is the nearest antecedent, the nearest object or subject of the pronouns, right? Can you send violent George on his violent way before I muzzle him? Is that clear? Is that clear to everyone? So, again, let me repeat. In the context, it is clear that Jesus is the nearest antecedent, right? The subject slash object of the pronouns. And to reinforce that Paul could describe Jesus in that manner, that Paul could say of Jesus, he's the only potentate, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. I'm showing you in other places where Jesus is called the very things that Paul says about Jesus, that he is the king of kings and Lord of lords, right? Let's go to Revelation 17, 14. Revelation 17, verse 14. Okay. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. See, the Lamb, Jesus Christ, he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now let's go to Revelation 19, verse 16, but we're going to read verses 11 to 16 for context. Revelation 19, verses 11 to 16, another place where Jesus is said to be King of kings and Lord of lords. Okay. Okay, now read with me. Revelation 19, 11 to 16. 
And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His, watch here, 12, eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head, pay attention here, verse 12, on his head were many crowns, many crowns. Okay? And he had a name written that no man knew but himself. Now, what is his name? Who is this person? Is it the Father, the Holy Spirit? Verse 13. And he is clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. No doubt this is Jesus. The rider on the horse, thus described, the Word of God, Jesus Christ. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Now 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So here's the second passage. The second passage. Where Jesus Christ is said to be King of kings, Lord of lords, Lord of lords, King of kings. And he is the King of all kings. He's the Lord of all kings. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Everyone getting this? Revelation 1 verse 5. Revelation 1 5. Okay. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The prince, the ruler, the archon of the kings of the earth. So Jesus Christ is the ruler of all the kings of the earth. He's the king of all kings, the Lord of all lords. Therefore, there's nothing in the context of 1 Timothy 6 that should cause you to hesitate to identify Jesus Christ as the one being described, as the only potentate, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone has the immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light that no one can see, right? Especially because of verse 14, it's Jesus Christ who's the one who's mentioned. So he's the last, thus named, person making him the object of those pronouns right all right Zena I will yell and then shower you with holy saliva and smack you in the mouth and say I laid hands on you so I don't go to jail so come on and by the way for those of you watching that's a joke so don't go and then report me okay let's go back now to first 76 15 and 16 because I want to explain how the Bible uses restrictive language so that you don't get confused. And this is going to help you in dealing with anti-Trinitarian objections. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate. Now watch here. Help and uh, He's the blessed and only potentate. Potentate means a sovereign ruler, right? You know, a dictator, uh, a ruler, like an emperor. Okay. Notice how the Bible uses the term only. Even though it says he's the only potentate, the only sovereign ruler, it goes on to say he's the king of other kings and lord of other lords. So you see how the Bible uses the language only? This is how the Bible uses the words only, alone, none else, no one. You have to be careful how the Bible uses such restrictive language because if you don't understand the Bible use of such language, you're going to create contradictions. In fact, you just created a contradiction in the first sentence, in, this, in the line itself. If Jesus is the only ruler, how then can he be said to be the king of other kings and lord of other lords? If he's the only ruler, there aren't other rulers, right? But Paul goes on to say there are other rulers, other lords, and he happens to be king and lord over them. So you understand how the word only is being used and not used? Not false gods, no. Caesar wasn't a false god. He was an emperor. Right. Only doesn't mean no one else. Only means that he is the source of all power, all rulership, all sovereignty. No one else could rule apart from him, permitting him and granting him authority. You understand what only means here? Only doesn't mean there aren't others who rule. Only mean that he is, in the ultimate sense, the true sovereign supreme authority and power and ruler and every other ruler and authority can only rule because of him permitting it because of his permission if he doesn't want you to rule you cannot rule 
If he doesn't want you to be king, you can't be king. Because all authority, all power, all sovereignty comes from him. And not just him alone, from him in union with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That's why when anti-Trinitarians quote passages that say the Father is only or one or this, that shows their ignorance of Scripture and they don't know how the Bible uses such language. Thank you, Napor. I receive it in Jesus' name for the sake of my children. Are you with me there? So you understand what it means for him to be the only potentate in the same sentence that says he's the king of others who are kings and lord of others who are lords? Doesn't mean there aren't any other ruler or lord. Is that clear? Are you learning how to interpret scripture? Because that's what I want to do. I may not be entertaining, but I want to educate you by the power of the Holy Spirit to know your Bible, understand it, and live it for the glory of Jesus. Clear? Okay. Let me show you that definition that I gave from scripture itself. That Jesus is the only potentate, not in the sense that there are others who rule. That means Jesus with the Father and the Spirit as the one God. Is the source of all power, all authority, all rulership, all sovereignty. And a person can only rule if the triune God, if Jesus grants him the authority to rule. Otherwise, he can never rule no matter how hard he tries. Okay? Now let me show you that meaning from Scripture itself. Are you ready? Daniel chapter 2, verses 37 to 38. Exactly, Nada. Daniel 2, 37 to 38. Daniel 2, 37 to 38. Thou, O king, speaking of the king of Babylon, Daniel speaking to him, saying, Art a king of kings, for the true God of heaven hath given thee, the true God, the God of heaven, hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Do you see what he's saying to this pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar, who eventually becomes a believer? It is the God of heaven that gave you the power to rule over the earth, who gave you a kingdom, who subjected even the beast to you. He did that. He did that, and he can depose of you very easily. Daniel 4, 24 to 26. Daniel 4, 24 to 26. This book is amazing, isn't it? You see the depth and the beauty of the, the Bible? It truly is the Word of God. And the God of the Bible is truly God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, Daniel 4, 24, 26. And bless Protestant believer for helping me by posting verses. This is the interpretation, O King. And this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King. Notice what he says. That they shall drive thee from men. And thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the earth. God is going to struck you like a dumb ox, like a dumb beast, and make you like a dumb animal until you realize who truly reigns. And they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times shall pass over thee till thou know, until you come to the realization that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth, giveth it to whomsoever he will. Bam. That's what it means for Jesus to be the only potentate. You understand it now? Because our triune God is amazing, Timothy, and the Bible is amazing. And the Holy Spirit who fills us, enables us to see how amazing our God is and this word is, and gives us the power to love him and obey him and proclaim his glory. Okay, Daniel 4, 31, 32. Exactly, Timothy. Because you're dealing with a God who's infinitely amazing beyond words and comprehension. Daniel 4, 31, 32. So your hope is not Trump. Your hope is in God to use Trump for his glory if God wants to. Daniel 4, 31, 32. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king, so audible voice again, Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of man and giveth it, gives it or giveth it, boy, I got a list, to him as ever he will. Did you catch it? That's what it means that our Lord Jesus is the only potent thing. 
while at the same time he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. In other words, Paul says of Jesus what can only be said of God. You can only say of God that God is the King of all kings, whether in heaven or on earth, the Lord of all lords, whether in heaven or on earth. And yet this is said of Jesus Christ our Lord by Paul in 1 Timothy and by John in Revelation, showing that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Clear? Is that you understand there? Now let me show you Nebuchadnezzar coming to his senses and becoming a believer. So at least one Babylonian king became a believer and was saved by the grace of God. At least one. I have it on Daniel's authority, who's an inspired prophet, that Nebuchadnezzar repented and became a believer. So he's in heaven with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Notice what Nebuchadnezzar says. Daniel 4, 34 to 37. He sounds like the prophets filled with the spirit. Notice Daniel 4, 34 to 37. Daniel 4, 34, 37. Your name's not Daniel, is it? All right, let's read. And the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. Because why? He lifted his eyes to heaven. And I blessed the Most High. Wow. The pagan Babylonian king blesses the God of Daniel. Not his gods, not Marduk or Nebo, Baal, Bel, but the God of Daniel. Right? You see what he says? Let's read it. I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored him that liveth forever. Notice he's even getting his theology right. He's the one who lives forever. Whose dominion is everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. They're nothing to him. And he does. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the atmosphere. What he wants to be done will be done. No one can stop him. And none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou. Wow. What beautiful theology coming out of Nebuchadnezzar. So God is disciplining him, not because he hates him, not because he wants to destroy him. He's disciplining him to bring him to the realization, I am the true God. Worship me so you can live. And it worked. Now let's read 36 and 37. At the same time, my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my Lord sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. What beautiful theology, right? Exactly, Riaz Kerechi, the Pharaoh of Joseph's time. Exactly, the Holy Spirit. Now, guys, I want you to learn something else. When God disciplines or punishes someone, at times the purpose why he brings about that discipline or punishment, it's not because he's trying to destroy the person or he hates the person. It's his way of getting the person to wake up, getting the person's attention. I am God who loves you. I am God who created you. I am the God who desires to save you. Therefore, wake up, turn to me and repent. Do you see the purpose and why he struck Nebuchadnezzar as a dumb beast eating grass like a madman? Okay, so that's what you see. So now, do you understand what it means for Jesus to be the only potentate in the same sentence where Paul says he's the king of kings and lord of lords? Doesn't mean there aren't any rulers. It means that Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ. They are the one source of all power, sovereignty, authority, rulership. Anyone who rules is because the triumph God has been pleased to allow them to rule. In other words, it wasn't your electoral votes that brought in Trump. The triumph God <clears throat> decreed Trump would win and worked in such a way within time and space to bring about Trump rising to the presidency. You get it? Making sense now? Okay. But that's also true of Obama. That's also true of Clinton. Now, why would God allow evil, corrupt rulers to rule as punishment for a nation that's rebelling against him and hating his word and hating him? 
God will often give you rulers after your heart. So if the nation's corrupt and hates God and opposes him, then what does he do? He then gives them rulers after their hearts to tickle their ears and hands them over. Right? Are you learning what the Bible is teaching? Are you learning more about the scriptures and the depth and beauty of scriptures? Well, Ra Ryoku, you're proving my point. People still love Obama. What does that say? And why did God allow him to rise to prominence? Because they wanted such a ruler who was just as corrupt and wicked and evil as they. Right? All right. And by the way, I'm not a politician. I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm not pro-Republican, pro-Democrat. I'm pro-Jesus and pro-Jesus' kingdom. My government is Jesus' kingdom, right? My ruler is King Jesus. And anyone who wants to advance the kingdom of Christ, anyone who wants to fight for the rule of Christ or fight for what Christ says is good and fight against what Christ says is evil and fight for the life of the unborn child and fight for traditional marriage and oppose same-sex marriage and transgenderism because it's an abomination to God, he's got my vote. Now let's go back to First Timothy. So don't think the Republican Party is Jesus' party or the Democratic Party is Jesus' party. Jesus has no party. We need to belong to Jesus' party. It's not the other way around. Send Tony on his merry way. You put me there? Okay. Let's go back to 1 Timothy 6 now. Let's look at 14, 16. Let me reinforce the point and explain what it means. So this passage, too, doesn't prove that God the Father has not been seen. Yep, choose Jesus. He is the party. Let's read it again. Guys, pay attention to the pronouns. Tell me who is being described in this manner. Pay attention. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now pay attention to the pronouns, guys. Pay attention. Our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed only potentate, King of kings, Lord of lords. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto. Whom no man hath seen or can see. To whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Is it clear that these pronouns all refer back to the last mentioned person in verse 14. Amen, Jonathan Soko. You see in verse 14, there is no mention of the Father. The Father is in 13, but the one mentioned last is Jesus Christ, not the Father. So don't let anyone quote this verse in saying it's about God the Father. And do not quote any translation that inserts the word God in there. I believe that's what the NIV does. You want me there? They insert the word God in the Greek. It doesn't say God. Okay, now. Now, what does it mean then for Jesus Christ to dwell in an unappro unapproachable light that no one can approach and whom no one has seen? Now, let me show you this is true of Jesus, that it's Jesus who dwells in light that you cannot approach. Let's look at 1 Timothy 6.16 again. You want further proof is Jesus? And from Paul's own experience, yeah, keep with the King James. It's a faithful translation, a God-honored translation. Okay, notice what it says about the light. Who alone, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light, which no man can approach unto. So this is a light you can't approach, right? Let me prove to you that Paul is referring to Jesus. In fact, let me prove to you that Paul is actually recounting his experience. The reason why Paul could say this of Jesus, not only because he's inspired by the Spirit, because he experienced the light of Jesus that blinded him. So he's talking from personal experience that Jesus Christ dwells in a light that could not be approached because it blinded me. Let me prove that to you. Are you ready? That Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is speaking from firsthand experience. What he experienced on the road to Damascus, that light that Jesus dwells in, that blinded him. So he's talking from actual experience of what he saw. You ready? Amen, Richard Ems. You are seeing the glory of Jesus. 
Are you guys ready for the proof? Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 9. I agree. J1739, stick with the receive text. I agree. I know I'm not going to be popular, but who cares, man? I'm, I'm already unpopular as it is. Okay, Acts 9, verses 1 to 9. Everyone read with me. Learn how to interpret Scripture and see how amazing Jesus is, how glorious Jesus is, that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit, and fall more passionately in love with Him and His Word. Be blown away by the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing like going into the Scriptures and understanding them. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto thy priest. Now watch, guys. Pay attention, please. You're going to be blown away. He's talking from what he experienced. He experienced that light that Jesus dwells in that blinded him, that he could not approach. And desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Hmm. Jesus dwells in unapproachable light. Hmm. Verse 4, read with me. Verse 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why per persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. So who was in the light? Whose voice did he hear from the light? Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now watch 6. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. Right? Now we'll watch here. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. Did you catch it? The light blinded him. He could see no man, and he went three days without sight. This is the light that you cannot approach that Paul was talking about because he saw the light and it blinded him, the light that clothes Jesus. So do you need further proof he's talking about Jesus? Jonathan, you haven't been listening to the sessions. I've actually showed you in the previous sessions, God the Father has been seen and can be seen. And even saying that, let me correct you why you should never repeat it. Notice what you said. Your comment is the problem I have with this teaching because people instinctively does dishonor the Lord not knowing it. Why would it be more terrifying to see the Father than the Son? Are you saying the Father is more holier than the Son, more glorious than the Son, better than the Son? Why would you not be terrified as much as seeing Jesus as you would be terrified of seeing the Father? I thought Jesus is equal to the Father, but that's what you just said without realizing you said it. You understand, Jonathan, why you should never say that? And I say this in love. What you just said made the Father greater than Son. Because why would you be terrified at looking at the Father, but not so much the Son? I thought the Son is equal in glory, majesty, and holiness to the Father. That's why I don't say that. If you can see Jesus, because Jesus is humble enough to allow you to see him in some form, then you can see the Father and the Spirit, because the Father is just as humble as the Son, and the Son is just as holy as the Father. Exactly, Bill Thompson. You understand now, folks? Okay, good. That's fine. Now, when you say both, amen. Okay, that's fine, Jonathan. Because you said the Father in the context of me speaking of the Son. Yes, we would be terrified, horrified to see any member of the Godhead. But that's why all three members of the Godhead, in their love and humbleness, condescend to appear in such a way that we can see them and not be consumed. You don't believe me? Read Revelation 1, where Jesus appears to John in his glorious form. And John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Revelation 1, 17, 18. And then he placed his right hand upon me. Jesus said, do not be afraid. You don't need to be afraid. I am the first last. I am he that lives. I was dead and behold, I live forevermore. And I hold the keys to death and Hades. Clear? 
Exactly, First Celeste. Now, near-death experiences simply confirm what the Bible says. So I accept these near-death experiences because the Bible confirms that such experiences are possible. And First Celeste just mentioned, and you can you Google their testimonies, and these are bona fide experiences. Not everyone, some do fake it, but even the medical field, skeptics, have concluded on the basis of these near-death and out-of-body experiences that consciousness is something separate from brain activity, and they've concluded that even when the brain dies and the heart stops, people continue to remain consciously alive. And that's the medical field. They're not necessarily Christians. And some of these near-death experiences even say that when they beheld the light of Christ, the light was so glorious that it would burn human eyes. Okay. Is it clear that when Paul says, who dwells in unapproachable light that no one can approach, he's talking about Jesus Christ and his experience with Jesus Christ? Is it clear that he's recounting his experience with the Lord Jesus whom he saw in this light that blinded him? So what more proof do you need that in the context of 1 Timothy 6, the context itself and the overall context of the Bible shows that he's talking about Jesus Christ in that context, not the Father? Is it clear? Now, let's go back and explain what it means. Let's go to 16 again. And let's explain it. What the last part means. Exactly. Blow up the channel for the glory of Christ. Okay. Let's go to 1 Timothy 6.16 one more time. Okay, just then just bear with us. Don't in interject with questions. Try to go back and hear it from the beginning. I'm showing the first Timothy 6 is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, read with me. Who only who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. We prove that's Jesus. But now this other part. Whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. Now, guys, question. How can this be Jesus when it says no man has seen him nor can see him? Well, very easy. Number one, the context shows it's Jesus. Starting at verse 14, it shows he's clearly talking about Jesus. Number two, the testimony of John and Revelation and Paul's own conversion in Acts 9 shows it's Jesus. So what, it mean, what does it mean that no man has seen or can see? And here's where people forget to understand. No one has seen Jesus as he is. No one has seen the Father as he is. No one has seen the Holy Spirit as he is. Meaning, when you see Jesus, you're seeing Jesus either in respect to his human nature, with that flesh body that he's now glorified, or you're seeing Jesus assume a form of some kind, like appearing as a lamb or appearing as a lion. But Jesus as God, as God, no one has seen or can see. The Father as God, in respect to the divine nature, no one has seen or can see. The Holy Spirit as God, in respect to his divine nature, no one has seen nor can see. Do you know why? Because the nature of God is invisible. The nature of God is spaceless. The nature of God is placeless. The nature of God is immaterial. The nature of God is incorporeal. So what's there to see? What's there to see? How can you see the nature of one who by nature is formless, shapeless, invisible, spaceless, timeless, incorporeal, and material. What's there to see? Thank you, Andrew. I love this guy. I'm telling you, he's a Christian at heart. Just He's going to watch. I prophesy in Jesus' name. Within a year, he's going to come out and say, I'm in love with Jesus again. I follow Jesus. He's my God. You with me there? So, Jesus as God in respect to his deity. Has anyone seen it? Let me repeat. Jesus as God in respect to his deity. Has anyone seen it? The Father as God in respect to his divine nature. Has anyone seen it? The Holy Spirit as God in respect to his divine nature. Has anyone seen it? No. 
King of Kings, you're still not getting it. The fullness of what? What's there to see? God by nature is invisible. God by nature is spaceless. God by nature is immaterial. There's nothing to see. So even your statement misunderstands the point. God by nature exists before time, space, and place. If you believe God created all time, all space, all, pl all, all place, then reason with me. That means God was there when there was no time. God was there when there was no space. God was there when there was no place. That means he has to be spaceless, placeless, and timeless. So he's shapeless. So what's there to see? No, Jesus isn't Melchizedek. Don't ask me questions when I'm discussing a topic right now, friend. So, yes, Jesus is God. No one has seen, can see, because you can't see Jesus' deity, his divine nature. So what's the problem with 1 Timothy 6, 15 to 16, being about the Lord Jesus Christ? What's the problem? Even when you say omnipresent, what does that mean, Elizabeth Tudor? What, do you, what does it mean, omnipresent? See, you, we're using terms and we have to explain them. I like Andrew. Notice the scientific explanation. To be seen in this universe, you need a photon from the sun striking the being and being reflecting of it and then impacting your eye and being sensed. Exactly. And God is not part of this creation. So do you understand contextually there's nothing in that passage that says it's not Jesus Christ and everything in context shows he's talking about Jesus Christ? You see? Do you understand that? Even when you say all present, all time. Now, see, let me explain what omnipresence doesn't mean. I love you guys. You know that, right? And as long as God gives me health and the grace and the wisdom, knowledge, and the faith and the love and devotion and holiness to glorify him, I'll teach you. Let me explain what omnipresence does not mean. Okay. I'm going to use this right here. When I say God is omnipresent, okay, or that God is in you, if I put coffee in this object i can say coffee is in this listening hold on frozen it's chosen all right okay surprise surprise it starts buffering when i'm about to get into deep theological point may the lord bless it and preserve it for his glory okay I put water in this bottle. I say water is in the bottle. So when I say God is in me, I do not mean God is in me substantially. That God is a material substance, a physical substance like water, and so that materially, physically, he's stuffed inside me, right? I don't mean that, right? That's not what I mean, correct? The, is the image clear? You guys can see me, right? Okay. So when I say God is in me and you, I don't mean God is like water, a substance that you can cram inside you physically. So that if you tear up in my chest, you're going to see God, that substance that's God. That's not what we mean. And by the way, if God is omnipresent, if God is omnipresent, that means he's present in everything, everyone. So are you saying God is also dwelling inside an unbeliever? Is God dwelling in an unbeliever? But wait, wait, wait. Guys, you said he's omnipresent. If he's omnipresent, that means he's also in an unbeliever. You can't tell me in one breath he's omnipresent, but then another breath say, well, he only lives in believers but not unbelievers. That means he's not omnipresent because he's not in unbelievers, so he's not present there. So do you mean he is omnipresent or not? Make up your mind. You see the contradiction. You know why there's a contradiction? Because we're not understanding these terms correctly. Now, do you want me to define what these terms mean and do not mean? No, it has nothing to do with unbeliever. Okay. Let me explain what these terms mean and do not mean. When I say God is omnipresent, if you take that literally, that means your chair, you're sitting on God. Because he's omnipresent, right? So that means he's you're sitting on God. And I don't mean to be irreverent. I just want to show you the foolishness and stupidity of not defining what omnipresence means and doesn't mean. If you sit on your toilet, you're sitting on God. God is in the garbage can. 
God is in your t-shirt. God is in your pockets. You see, you see how silly that is? That's actually blasphemous, isn't it? Correct? So let me explain what omnipresence means. Omnipresence doesn't mean that God is like water, a substance, something tangible, physical, substantial, that I can stuff in something so that this stuff called God, this substance called, is in everything. Omnipresence simply means, simply means that the entire creation is being sustained by God, controlled by God, preserved by God and is being given life by God. So there is no part of creation where God isn't controlling, sustaining, guiding, watching over. You understand? Eric, do you want me to block you for ignoring the past 60 minutes when I said that the nearest antecedent of the pronouns is Jesus Christ, who's mentioned right after the Father in verse 13 and 14? You want me to send you on your merry way? Okay. So that's what omnipresence means. It doesn't mean everywhere you touch it's God. That's Hinduism. If you believe that literally, you're Hindus because Hindus believe in pantheism. All is God and panentheism. God is in everything. Right? So that you're God too. That's not Christianity. That's Hinduism. So you understand what omnipresence doesn't mean, right? Omnipresence doesn't mean that God is a substance that actually substantially fills things like water fills a cup. Omnipresence means that God is controlling every part of creation. He's sustaining every part of creation. He's guiding every part of creation, giving life to every part of creation, and he's aware of everything that takes place everywhere. It, it really is simply another way of saying that he's om omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing. So you understand what it means and doesn't mean now? Even when you say God's presence is elsewhere, always here. What does that mean, God's presence? Define your term, Elizabeth. Don't just repeat a term. Okay. Does everyone understand what it means and doesn't mean? If someone's confused, put it to. Anyone confused? I don't even know what you mean, the Holy Spirit understood. Yes. That's true of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Father, Son, Holy Spirit control every part of creation, sustain every part of creation, guide every part of creation, give life to every part of creation, right? And are aware of everything that takes place in creation. Okay, is that clear? Then what does it mean when I say the Holy Spirit is in me, the Father is in me, the Son is in me, but not an unbeliever? I don't mean the Holy Spirit is a substance again, a material that you can put physically in me like you do water, like I put water. When you say the Spirit is in you, but he's not an unbeliever, you mean the Spirit is in fellowship with you, in communion with you, instructing you, teaching you, preserving you to be faithful in love with Jesus, and disciplining you when you sin. It's He's in you relationally, relationally, not materially, substantially. He's in relationship with me, in communion with me, teaching me, guiding me, correcting me, loving me, encouraging me, disciplining me. That's what it means. Is it clear now what it means and doesn't mean? Yep. Well, even in, say, context, not physical contact, means he's in communion with you and fellowship with you. He's guiding you, instructing you, teaching you, correcting you, preserving you. That's what it means. So don't repeat the misunderstanding, wrong definitions of omnipresence and God indwelling you. Now, do you want me to prove to you when I said God is omnipresent in that the entire creation is before God? He watches over every part of creation, sustains every part of creation, right? And he's aware of everything in creation. Do you want me to prove that to you by showing you that God is even in hell in that sense? I don't know what you're doing. You want to prove that to you? Okay. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. I need you to do something. Please. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. 
Yeah, it's my brother here. Say hi again. The brother who hosted me. They're Hello, guys. Yeah. The brother who hosted me, who paid for my trip, took me to the conference. Him and his wife have been a blessing. Pray for them. God bless them. Sustain mm -hmm. them. Provide for them. Fill them. And open doors of ministry because he's a soldier of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. And that I can be a blessing. I've been a burden on him guys. so far. But hold on. He's got to take this picture. Hold on. Take a picture. Okay. Hold on, guys. This is Ali needs, needs to tell you something also. Okay. Right here, take a picture. Is that my I guess it's sunglasses? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Save it. Okay. I'm almost done here. Uh, no, we'll talk. Okay, guys, you get it? Moving in, huh? Yeah, Driving I got I'm, I'm going to take my... over, man. <laughs> right. Okay, you guys ready? Revelation 14, 9, 11. I got a couple more minutes. I'm done. Because this, this, this session's almost done. You got to admit, I'm one handsome dude, right? Okay, now read with me. Revelation 14, 9 to 11. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, pay attention, guys. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Did you guys catch it? Those who will be tormented in lake of fire will be tormented with the Lamb's presence being there. The Lamb will be present there overseeing the punishment. Now, folks, how can the Lamb, Jesus Christ, be present in hell and also be present with believers in the new heavens and the new earth at the same time because jesus as god is everywhere meaning the entire creation is before him he watches over it sustains it guides it but physically bodily in his human nature in his physical bodily existence he'll be in the new heaven and our earth just like right now jesus physically bodily is in heaven in his glorified physical body on the throne. But as God, the entire creation is before him. So he's with me right now. He's sustaining me right now. He's filling me with his love and joy right now because as God, all creation is before him. Right? Exactly. Angela got it. Jesus will be present with believers in heaven or in the new heaven or earth in love in fellowship, in peace and joy. But he's present in hell, in judgment, in punishment, in justice. You see the difference? He's present in hell to punish and judge righteously. But he's present in heaven, or in the new heavens, new earth, in love, in fellowship, in peace and joy. Now, I hope you learned a lot about your Bible, a lot about your theology, a lot about your God, and now are more in love with him. Right now, let's look at a final passage, and my time will be up. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Pay attention. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Thank the Lord Jesus, Rebel Mark. And ask the Lord to open that door for me to leave, that they won't close it on the other side. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Well, more people need this, so pass the link on, you know, and ask them to come and join the channel. Okay, let read with me. Psalm 139, 7 to 12. Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Notice even God's spirit is omnipresent. David says, where can I flee from your spirit? Nowhere. Everywhere I go, your spirit is there. Pay attention, folks. Read 7 again. Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Answer, the Holy Spirit, you can't escape him. Wherever you go, the spirit is already there. Whether shall I free, flee from thy face, thy presence? Nowhere. Everywhere I go, your presence is there. If I ascend up into heaven... Thou art there. See, if I go to heaven, you're already there. Now watch this part, verse 8. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. Wait, even in hell, in Sheol, in Hades, in the netherworld, in the grave, you're there? So if I'm in heaven, you're already there? If I'm in hell or Sheol, in the grave, you're there? Wherever I go, you're there? Yes, because the entire creation is overseen by God, preserved by God, guided by God, <clears throat> And God is aware of every part of creation. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, pitch darkness that no one can see. Even the night shall be light about thee, about me. Even pitch darkness is like daylight to you, right? Even darkness is like daylight to you, right? And then 12, yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. 
Darkness, day, daytime means nothing to you. They're the same to you because you see perfectly clear whether it's pitch dark or light. Clear? In fact, if you read Psalm 139, verses 1 to 16, there you're going to be taught the following things about the triune God. And don't forget how verse 7 started. Not only I can't flee from your face, your presence, I can't escape your spirit. Where can I go from your spirit? Even your spirit is present everywhere with you. Your face is everywhere. Your spirit is everywhere in the sense that I define. You know what everywhere means now, right? Not that God is a substance, a material substance, and that material substance is everywhere. It's, you know, you understand what it means now, right? Right? So now when someone tells you, what does it mean for God to be omnipresent? Explain what it doesn't mean and what it does mean. What does it mean that God is in you? Explain what it means and what it doesn't mean. Okay, But Psalm 139, verses 1 to 16 is powerful because Psalm 139, verses 1 to 6, shows God is omniscient, perfectly knowing. 7 to 12 shows that he's omnipresent. The entire creation is present before him, and he watches over it and sustains it. Right? Verses 13 to 16 shows that God is omnipotent and the creator. He creates all life. And even numbers the years that you will live. So in verses 1 to 16, you have omniscience, omnipresence, omnipotence, all in one. Is that clear? Now, to conclude this series, to conclude this series, that I pro provide irrefutable contextual evidence that in 1 Timothy 6, Verses 13 to 16. Paul is saying about the Lord Jesus Christ. That it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is the only potentate. King of kings. Lord of lords. Who dwells in unapproachable light. That no one can approach. Who no man has seen. Nor can see. Is it clear in the context it's about Jesus Christ? Clear? So if it's clear, what verse can someone now quote to you and show you God the Father has never been seen and cannot be seen? Is there a verse that teaches that? But you got to go listen to the previous sessions. Let me repeat. There isn't a single passage of Scripture, if you interpret it correctly in context, that says God the Father has not been seen, nor can he be seen. Actually, the opposite is true. He has been seen and will be seen in glory. So what argument can someone now present to you to show you? Jesus Christ, right, can't be God because God cannot be seen. Or the Father cannot be seen, but Jesus Christ can and the Spirit can. There's nothing. It's another tradition of men that you need to die to and reject and stick to Scripture because our prayer to the Holy Spirit is, Holy Spirit, please help us. To be as biblical as possible to understand the scriptures with wisdom from your presence and then give us the power to then live the bible for the glory of jesus and live it perfectly to be perfect worshipers obedient worshipers of the father and the son and the holy spirit that's our prayer i don't want to be protestant calvinist arminian catholic i want to be a biblicist that's my prayer I want to know the Bible and live it out for the glory of Jesus. Is that clear? Now, Lord willing, I'll try to do another session Friday or Saturday if I have time. If not, God willing, pray for me. I return Saturday night, but I need your prayers, guys. The green light, I've been given green light from my state to leave. I need an answer, please, favorable answer, that God will give me the answer within this week. I can get my license updated, get my car tuned up and then i get an answer saying you can come and relocate please i need to be free otherwise this state with this corrupt wicked evil judge this agent of satan will try to destroy me pray god saves me and my daughters saves me financially provides for me brings my daughters into my life and if the lord wants me to be single to give me the content the grace to be content but if he has a godly woman in love with jesus who will be a blessing to me and i'll be a blessing to her Pray God will reveal that sooner than later, right? I'll mention it when I get the green light, beware, right? 
Yes, I know. Lucifer is your father. And your mother is the bride of Lucifer. Okay. Anyway, bounce this guy and send them to Asheron. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Yes, I do have PayPal. Angela, contact me, guys. If you want to know how to support, send me an email. Here you go. Sam Shamoon at yahoo.com. We can use the support to stay in ministry for the glory of Christ. Remember, Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is truly Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. We love you, Lord Jesus. We trust in you. Forgive us. Cover us by your blood. Seal us by your spirit and transform us to become more like you. And Lord Jesus, please, please, Lord, you've been with me and you'll never leave me. Be with my daughters and fight for us and release me to go. Please, Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. We depend on you. Have mercy on us, Master, and fight for my daughters and convict their mother. You are truly the Father's beloved, his heart in the flesh, our God and Savior. And we love you because you love us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Come sooner than later in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. Lord willing, I'll either see you tomorrow or Saturday. If not, Sunday, pray. And hit the like button, subscribe, and pass these videos. Let's make it go viral for the glory of Christ.